Hola chicos, buenas tardes. Eh, vamos a dar inicio al meetup. Paréntesis, este es un meetup eh, extraoficial, o más bien un super especial, porque no es el típico meetup que organizamos y lo que viene frecuentemente, no es un meetup que se realiza cada fin de mes, el último lunes. Entonces, este, por una situación eh, muy particular, de que puedo estar en visita aquí en la Ciudad de México, porque eh, se está realizando este meetup. Y esperemos que nos dé tiempo para realizar nuestro tradicional mito que eh, hacemos. Es un evento especial. Eh, ¿Qué tenemos para hoy? Básicamente es la presentación de Borg. Vamos a estar hablando de Kubernetes y Java y muchas cosas más. Tenemos cerveza, eh, habrá pizza y tenemos por allí una sorpresa. Entonces, no se vayan, pues, espérense en el transcurso del evento. Les vamos a, a decir de qué se trata. Eh, next, please. Eh, supongo que todos entraron a través de la página de Meetup o entraron a algún otro medio. Es, es la página oficial que tenemos como grupo a través del cual vamos organizando los eventos y los vamos publicando. Entonces, si no están registrados y si se entraron por algún otro medio, les recomendamos que entren a la página de Meetup y se registren también para estar atentos de todos los avances que, de los eventos que vamos haciendo. Eh, para estar en contacto con nosotros, tenemos básicamente. Eh, algunas redes sociales, si no nos siguen en Twitter, por favor, tenemos dos cuentas, son dos cuentas hermanas, son amigas, pueden seguir cualquiera de las dos. Este, y ahí también, este, a través de este medio, nosotros estamos publicando frecuentemente avisos, noticias y cosas relacionadas a los, al trabajo que venimos haciendo como comunidad. Tenemos un canal de Slack, este, si no tienen Slack, por favor, este creense una cuenta, regístrense. ¿Qué es esto? Tenemos, este, son chats de discusión, foros de discusión en tiempo real, y eh, aquí interactuamos mucho como comunidad. Hay muchos usuarios que, que ya están registrados, y todos los días sale algún tema nuevo, a veces este, algo de bastante interés, a veces un tanto, a veces es algún tema muy random que se discute, etc. Pero generalmente hay temas y discusiones bastante buenas que se van dando, este día a día, ¿no? Entonces, la invitación es para que se registren, ese es en automático, simplemente tienen que ingresar su dirección, de correo electrónico les llega un link de autorización o link, y en automático entran a, a Slack, ¿vale? Tenemos eh, el patrocinio de JetBrains, este, nos dan licencias para el día a día, entonces, básicamente, si alguien necesita eh, alguna, quiere una, Puede estar por aquí, me avisan, me dan su correo, sus datos, y este, nada, le mando un código de, ¿cómo le llaman? Un cupón de descuento, 18% de descuento, entonces pueden tener eh, el y el día de forma gratuita, con ese cupón que yo les puedo dar, ¿vale? Eh, los agradecimientos, le damos primero las gracias a KMMX. ¡Bravo! Sí. Los, al, al ser un evento especial, eh, pues obviamente tuvimos que buscar a dónde realizarlo. Y este, bueno, gracias a Alex, que está aquí presente, que nos está hospedando en esta, en esta ocasión. Gracias. Okay. Eh, paréntesis, nuestro invitado del día de hoy trabaja en Red Hat. Además de que viene como invitado y a presentar y a dar una charla, también nos está patrocinando con la cerveza. Entonces, gracias. La pizza viene cortesía de Nirso. Este, amigos de Nirso, gracias. Ellos frecuentan, bueno, no sé si han escuchado de Nirso, pero bueno, así. así ¿no? Es una de, de las mejores empresas en cuanto a desarrollo de software que existen aquí en México. Only four. Entonces, ellos frecuentemente están solicitando personas altamente capacitadas en muchas tecnologías y frecuentemente requieren personas que sepan Java. Entonces, no está por demás que vean las ofertas que tienen ahorita y si les interesa alguna de ellas o si tienen interés en alguna de ellas o si tienen interés en saber cómo es Nirso y por qué les interesaría trabajar allí. Allá hay dos personas que trabajan en Nirso que les pueden compartir su experiencia, hacer gente con ellos y platicen. Pregunten más bien eh, qué es Nirso, cómo se trabaja allí y por qué. Hiciéramos eso. Eh, bueno, le dejo el, el control a Borg. 
Que la charla va a ser en inglés, aquí. Okay. You are going to say in English. Only English. English. <risa> la presentación va a ser en inglés, pero bueno, espero que. Con traducción simultánea. No, creo. Oh, cielo. So, please. Welcome. And I'll, I'll just explain something that's very important right up front. It looks like I should speak Spanish, right? Yes. <laughs> is, it, is, is, it, is it the goatee? Yeah, like you? Not one? I'm actually from Hawaii. Okay. And in Hawaii, they taught us how to speak French or Hawaiian or Japanese, but not Spanish. And so, I actually, I grew up in Hawaii. I was not quite Waikiki. So I was actually in Pearl City, which is right above Pearl Harbor. Okay. And so if you're looking down the mountain, Pearl Harbor is here. So if you're top of the mountain, and Waikiki is all the way over there. So actually from my classes in high school, I could see from Diamond Head and Waikiki, Honolulu, over to Pearl Harbor. Wow. Which made it really hard to concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> But that's where I first learned how to program. So that's where I first learned how to build Pascal-based applications on an IBM PC with dual floppies, if you remember that. Yes. Right? And dual floppies were awesome. One for the compiler, one for your data. It was a big, big win. It was a massive win. Get a picture of that? Okay. I'm gonna, we're going to try some things here if we can. Let's see here. We're going to be doing not that. Not that, not that. Let's see. This is going to be a little bit messy for a moment because I'm still trying to sort things out. Is it this one? Yeah. Too many windows open, right? Got that one. This one. Yeah. So I'll warn you right now. I normally do this presentation in three hours. We don't have three hours, do we? <laughs> we'll keep you here all night. But there's something I want to do. I want to try, we're going to try a Twitter raffle tonight. So the, what I'm looking for is tweets that mention me at Burr Sutter and also have the hashtag Java Cube. So let's see if we can, you know, write this down on the board over here real quick. I, I think this will work. All right, so it's... Hashtag Java Cube and then at Versutter. So that little tool should help us find those tweets. And I have another tool. We're going to use another tool. And what we'll do is with uh, the tool, we'll pick a tweet and then uh, we have some books to give away. So myself and Christian Posta wrote a book on Istio. So, and we're going to talk a little bit about Istio tonight. It's kind of that next generation of Kubernetes and beyond for microservices. And then we have two Chromebooks also. And the good news is the plugs match here in Mexico. So I have two. Yeah. What's that? Work on it. How much is the voltage? How much is the voltage? I don't know. It says whatever it comes in North America. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because everything I plug in here seems to work. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. I'm going to show you guys a bit of two presentations. So one presentation you want to make note of is Bitly Nine Steps Awesome, and that gives you access to the slide deck, and then that'll be some uh, introductory Kubernetes content. So one uh, one thing I'm curious about right away is how many people here have been hands-on with Docker at this point. Okay, a lot of people use Docker. How many people have been hands-on with Kubernetes? Okay, a fair number of you, fantastic. And most people here have been hands-on with Java, right? Okay, good. So we found the right place. <laughs> This gentleman wearing, is wearing his older Java uh, shirt there, yeah. Yeah, with the original logo. So I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I've never been to Mexico City. I've been all around the world, but not to Mexico City. Uh, and it was the first time the Red Hat Mexican team brought me in. Uh, so norm I just kind of go where Red Hat needs me to go, which is everywhere. Uh, and today we did a big presentation uh, for, uh, for Red Hat here in town. Uh, you guys should have saw that 
link as well earlier. Uh, but that's why I'm here, and I was so happy to find you guys to, to basically come to a presentation at the local meetup. I particularly love Java user groups. I actually was the president of a Java user group for many, many years in Atlanta, Georgia. I also started my own developer conference called Dev Nexus. It was still operating today in Atlanta, Georgia. It's about a 2,000 person developer conference now. And so there's, uh, there's just a lot going on in the Java ecosystem. You'll find that developer conferences as well as uh, developer meetups and user groups are exploding. I mean, there's new ones being born and the existing ones selling out, filling up around the globe. So while a lot of people would like to say Java is dead, it is the, <laughs> it is the healthiest it's ever been. So there are more Java jobs out there than we can, you know, there's two jobs for everybody in this room, in this town, okay? There's 40 jobs, you know. <laughs> so that's the good news for us. Uh, and I want you guys to think about that for a second, because here's the thing to really understand about what it means to do software development. When I was sitting in a classroom in Hawaii with my two little, with my IBM PC with dual floppies, I learned that if I could type commands into a computer, it would do what I told it to do. And think about that for a second. It's like magic. You type in text and the computer does the thing. And so that is actually a superpower all of us have in this world. There are 7 billion people on this planet. There's what, 10 million people here in Mexico City? Or 20 million? I've lost track. 24. <laughs> 24 million? How many software developers are in this room right now? 24 million people in the city, and there's 40 people here? You truly are the elite of the elite of the elite. You guys hear about the one percenters, right? You're like the 100th percenters. There are so few people that can do what we do. There are so few people on this planet. There's only maybe 10 million professional software developers of 7 billion globally. And all of those people want us to build them digital APIs, digital capabilities, digital applications. And that's really the superpower we all bring to the table. So just think about that for a second, because I think that's huge. And this has changed a lot for me over the last 30 years. I've been programming for 32 years. It wasn't that way 32 years ago, okay? So things have fundamentally changed. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna show you a little bit of this presentation, and I'm gonna show you a little bit, a lot of this presentation. So this is the other URL you'll want, bit.ly Istio intro, and that's the two presentations we'll bounce around in a little bit tonight. As I said, both of them are actually three hour presentations. So six total hours of content, but we'll go through it kind of fast, hopefully not too fast. Am I speaking too fast now? Because no. I this is as slow as I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get. I want to just show you something real quick. I am actually running on this computer a virtual machine with eight gigabytes of RAM and two cores, two CPUs. In that in that virtual machine, I'm running a, a, a what's called OpenShift, which is Red Hat's version of Kubernetes. And you can see I have a lot of things running in it now. And we're going to show you a couple of these applications. Like here's the one we'll, we'll start with and focus on. Okay. Uh, and actually we'll have a little fun with it. But the concept is this is a cloud running on my computer. A whole cloud. A whole Kubernetes cluster or OpenShift cluster running on my laptop. And I also have one running at Amazon, which is, this is Amazon. I have running one at Azure. And this is the Azure one, okay? One at Google as well. This is the Google one. And that's kind of the point. You can, once you build your application this way, it's like the old school Java. Remember old Java? Write once, run anywhere? Yeah, okay. Now it's build the Kubernetes, run it anywhere, as long as Kubernetes is there. So you'll have to learn Kubernetes. That requires some learning. It's not just plain Java anymore. There's a little, little nuances to it, but not much. It's pretty much, you know, pretty easy stuff. But then you can actually take your application and run it on any cloud. And I consider that as a massive win, a huge win, because that way you're not bound to the Amazon-only cloud. How many people use Amazon's cloud at this point? Okay, a lot of you, right? Anybody using the Azure cloud? Microsoft. 
Okay, a couple of you. How about Google? Any Googlers out there? This one gentleman has, he does all three. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's kind of a point. Every cloud is unique, but if you treat them as Kubernetes, they're the same. They look the same. You can talk to them the same. Okay? What's different is, you know, this is different. This is, you know, Google versus Azure, right? This is all very different. And it's, and it's pretty hard. But once you're in Kubernetes, it's all the same. It all looks the same. It all behaves the same. Now, there's some nuances. Storage is a bit unique. Azure storage is very unusual, right? And there's some other gotchas that here or there, but otherwise, you can make it work. Uh, and I'm running this one right here locally. This is my local one. Okay? So let's kind of walk you through a couple things, uh, and then we'll, we'll get into the presentation. Let's see here. Yeah. Uh, we'll start here. Okay? A great movie. One of my favorite movies as a child. And so I, I call this presentation Enter the Service Mesh. It's like Enter the Dragon. It's kind of the same idea for me. So I'm, next Monday, I'm actually going to unveil my Bruce Lee specific presentation at uh, All Things Open's keynote. So I'll be at All Things Open in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, Monday. That's a 3,000 person event. And then I fly that day over to uh, Oracle Code One in San Francisco, and I have a presentation there Tuesday and Thursday, I think. I can't remember. Next week, something like that. All right, so this is something that's actually very important. I like to think of everybody being on a journey. Everybody's part of an evolutionary process. And one key element to making you successful in the future is DevOps. And I'd like to I talk about DevOps a lot. I talked about it this morning at the keynote for the, the Red Hat event. Uh, we can spend a lot of time talking about DevOps. I have a whole one-hour presentation on DevOps. We don't have a lot of time tonight. Okay? Then you have to think in terms of self-service, on-demand, elastic infrastructure. For the software developers in the room, I want you to just think about one thing. When your boss or your business, your marketing department, whomever, has this crazy idea, your CEO goes, we're going to run an ad during the World Cup when Mexico is playing Russia, you know, something like that, okay? Or they're playing in Russia. But when we're going to run an ad, and I need this new API ready to go because when the ad hits, it's going to drive a million new visitors to our application. One million is the new customer acquisition we're going for. And you as a software person are like, no, we can't take a million customers right now. And, but, you know, they, that's, the, that's the business desire. Okay? That's what the business wants. So what you need is you'll figure out how to solve that problem. You might, okay, you might thinking, okay, I can't do that with that crappy old web sphere that I have. <laughs> I can't do it with that crappy old web logic. But maybe I'll use a new reactive architecture, right? A high scale architecture like Vertex, which is the thing I'll play, I'll show you tonight. Or, you know, uh, the new reactive Spring Boot, okay? Or Akka, right? Something crazy scalable. Just, you know, with an Apache Kafka backend. That way we can handle a million concurrent users kind of thing. And with Vertex, you can do a million concurrent users. So you, you, you're going to write it for that. But the, here's the problem. You got the idea. You, have, you want to run an experiment, run some load tests, you know, try some prototypes. And you go to your ops team, and they say, oh, we'll get you that virtual machine or set of virtual machines. It's only going to be two weeks. So now you have to wait two weeks to run your experiment. And they don't set it up right. So they got to go fix it. It takes two more weeks. And you can see the problem here, hopefully. <laughs> If you have to go from idea to experiment and you have to wait weeks or even days or even hours, you've waited too long. So in this new world we're living in, you should wait no longer than about 30 to 80 seconds to get what you need because that's the way of the cloud. And what you see with all these things here I'm running, that's the way it works. You spin up a new pod, in the case of Kubernetes, Basically, a pod is nothing more than your application virtual machine. Think of it like that, right? With your Java virtual machine set up in it, or your Node.js, or your Python, or your C++. It doesn't matter what's in there. And you spin up one, two, three, four, five, like that. And you're like, oh, got it wrong. Tear them down, spin them up again. So that's really what the second point's about. You should be able to do it rapidly, with no wait time. Okay? You should also think about automation. In this new world, you're no longer feeding CDs into CD trays, or in my case, dual floppies, you know, <laughs> 30 years ago. 
you're no longer going to SSH into a remote computer and yum install and yum install and yum install or app get install or app get. You're not going to do that anymore. In the new world, you use Puppet or Chef or Ansible, okay, and therefore it installs. It will SSH in on your behalf. It'll yum install this, 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 and this on your behalf. It's a robot. It's a bot. It builds the server up, and if it needs to, it'll tear the server down. And this concept is known as a Phoenix server. If you guys heard the term Phoenix, right? Phoenix rises from the ashes to be born again. And you can burn it to the ground and bring it back from the dead versus a Snowflake server, which is unique for every installation. This is critical. You need to be in this mindset where the server should be burn it to the ground and recreate it. That concept will allow you to build new iterations faster, try experiments faster, get to production faster. Okay? Then you think in terms of your CI, CD, and deployment pipeline, so continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous delivery, continuous improvement, depending on how you define these terms. I imagine most people here are using something like Jenkins, right? But here's the trick. If you read the book from Jez Humble, and then see a presentation from Jez, he wrote the book on continuous delivery. He says, it's a real simple thing. What's your, your software in trunk, your root of your source control, uh, source code repository, is always ready for production. Can you pass that test? You gotta think about that. You're like, well, no, I checked in some junk, okay? And the next test is, and everybody on the team checks in daily. That's how, that's how disciplined you are from a software engineering standpoint. You know you have great tests. You know you write clean code. You build all the capabilities you need into your IDE to ensure that when you basically type that code in, you don't just compile it and throw it over the wall, okay, like we used to in school. Oh, it compiled. I'm done. No. You compile it. You build it. You run all the unit tests you possibly can against it and some integration tests where possible. You probably have a special place within your zero, you know, your zero wait time cluster because it takes no time. You don't wait any longer, and you basically run all your load tests and soap tests and integration tests there too. You know it's ready to go to the trunk. You know you're ready to check it in. Okay, so this right here is the advanced deployment techniques. This is actually where we'll be focusing more tonight. Okay, is this concept here? We're going to show you blue green deployment, canary deployment, things like that. But this allows you to basically produce a new software package, move it through your deployment pipeline into production incredibly fast, even if it's wrong and bad. In other words, you're going to be testing in production. And that's the new way to think. Because there's no other environment like production, right? Production's unique. So we're going to show you some tricks on how to test in production. Okay? That's I know. <laughs> and then you'll be ready to be a unicorn too. And use things like microservices and all that really cool stuff you hear about. You know, Silicon Valley unicorn. Now here's a trick. There's no such thing as unicorns. Even here in Mexico. Okay? <laughs> and I do love the local art, right? Where uh, especially the uh, Mayan, the ancient, you know, uh, the ancient art you see from like the Mayan culture and things like that, you know, there's some pretty weird stuff there, right? Mm -hmm. That creature doesn't really exist. Well, unicorns don't really exist. Okay, uh, let's keep going though. This is actually the area though we're going to see with Kubernetes and we're going to see with Istio. It kind of helps you in this space here in the middle. And the goal is to help you guys to get through this process so you can actually then use these capabilities. So here's your application today. We call it a monolithic application. You guys, if you've been around building applications for a while, you built your Java files, .java files, which compile to your .class files. You put those in your .jar files, right? Java archive, your, your beans go in a jar. You remember that, okay? Yeah. Then we put that into our war. We made love, not war. I'm sorry, war, not love, right? And then you put the war into your ear. And that's what we did. We did that for WebLogic, we did that for WebSphere, we did that for JBoss. I'm an old JBoss guy, okay? That's how we did it. And we knew what that looked like. We still run many of our systems today using that architecture. We know exactly how to get our arms around that ear file. And that ear file might be 10 gigabytes in size at this point. 
I've seen some really big ones, haven't you? Right? There's a lot of stuff in there. There's three, four big war files. With, someone put all the PDFs in there too because it was easier to serve them that way. Right? There's video clips in there. But we should think about our application though as a series of modules or actual services. It, yes, it's this big blob, but there's a bunch of key components inside it that represent certain business functionality inside that application. And we can think of those modules in very clever ways. Now we would have been we would have been safe. We should have been safe. But you know what happened? The original architect drew a picture on the whiteboard, and it didn't really work out that way. Okay? Because in Java, we actually took advantage of the fact that as long as it's in the class path, we could reach over and touch someone else's code. We could new that class from someone else's library when we really shouldn't have. We didn't practice going through interfaces. We just went directly to the object of the class file that we needed, okay? We didn't properly use factories. We didn't properly use interfaces. But that's the downside. Have we really been modular? And I don't mean OSGI-type modules or Java 9-style modules. I just mean good, clean, you know, everything comes through a factory, everything done through an API. Had we done that, we'd be a little bit better off, okay? But now we want to talk about microservices. And we, our application actually starts to fade into the background and really we focus on just these components. And we start to scatter these components across a network. And that's where it gets interesting. We put a network in between our application calls. What used to be a new that other class, method call, method call, method call, all in memory, now is scattered across a network with HTTP or gRPC or some other network mechanism. <coughs> We also say in the microservices principles, you have to have your own database. So we used to have this big old Oracle, or DB2. You guys love Oracle, right? No. Yeah, DB2. Okay, and we have multiple points of entry now. Like that, uh, when I mentioned earlier, the CEO wants to run an ad for the World Cup. They want a million new customers. Get that new API ready to go, because all those customers are going to come through a certain relationship that we're going to establish with a new business partner. Okay. So here's the key microservices principles. We've been talking about these now for years, so hopefully you guys are familiar with the concept. We're not gonna, we don't have time to really dig into all of them though. Uh, but just really the number one for me is deployment independence. My independent team should be able to take the code base that they check into daily, that they know is always ready for production, that they run great tests on and always have great automated tests, and they be, should be able to roll that single independent unit into production through their automated pipeline into a Kubernetes style cluster with a canary deployment mechanism. And they should be able to do that without disturbing any other organization or any other group in the organization. I have a question. Yes. What's the difference between microservices and CGI? And what kind of beans? CGI beans on the 90s. <laughs> I mean, they are the same. Um, they, they are, they're actually not. If you think I mean, about it. What's funny is your comment about CGI, if you guys don't know Common Gateway Interface, uh, it, it existed with the NCSA web server and then the Apache web server. So we're talking a long time ago. You pretty much could only write them in Perl back then. Okay, They eventually then added NSAPI and ISAPI for C++, so C++ or Perl. And it would, and so in that case, every time you went to a certain URL, it would spawn a whole new operating system process to run the Perl script to do what it was supposed to do and respond back. So it was all synchronous, and a new process was born with every every click of the button. Yeah, I mean, as far as I can understand, microservices work with the same principle. In this case, though, it doesn't spawn the process. The process is already living. The process also adheres to a beautiful API. Okay. Okay. That's very critical. A documented API, you treat it like a product, not a project. By product, it means you're building a software as a service for another business partner. You guarantee backward compatibility if you're well-documented API. That's a okay. very key principle. Okay. Uh, you, you also can deploy these things in a rapid fashion without tearing down the web server that it's tied to because each of them has their own web server. Okay. Okay. And, and service discovery is part of the application architecture here. In the case of the old CGI architecture, uh, there was no service discovery. It all had to come through the main root URL. Yeah, yeah. That was it, right? It was just based on the pathing, the paths that are part of that. 
Now, most people would say CGI is more like serverless architecture. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the impression that I have at this point. I'm running. <laughs> and the way to think of the, all these things, the beautiful thing about technology is it just keeps repeating itself. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and we get incrementally better with every iteration. Okay. Okay. You know, so the stuff like you'll see in the demonstrations, we couldn't do with old school NCSA or, um, or Apache web server back then, or O'Reilly web server, if you remember that one, or if you remember ISAPI with IIS, yeah. you know, back in the day when we were thinking about internet information server, things work very different now. Okay? So, yeah, but so let me show you some things, though, with this. Let's see if we can have a little fun with this. Um, dun, 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 dun. I want to try something. We're going to just experiment here a little bit. Let's see. Do I have this one down here? Stein step down here? All right. Uh, let's see here. Up to date. Fantastic. Okay. Spring Boot. Let's just look at Spring Boot here. All right. Here's my little application. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Okay, we're going to show you this little application. Now, one, a couple things to note right away. I'm using Visual Studio Code. The reason I'm using Visual Studio Code is we actually at Red Hat provide the Java support for this. So we provide, of course, we work on Eclipse, Eclipse Desktop. How many Eclipse users out there still? Well, come on, are you embarrassed? <laughs> How many IntelliJ users out there? Yeah. Ah, okay. The cool kids use IntelliJ. Um, but so we don't work on IntelliJ. That's a bunch of Russians that work on IntelliJ. Okay. But at Red Hat, we work on Eclipse Desktop and we work on Visual Studio Code. And you can see there's been uh, eight million eight million downloads of the Java support for Visual Studio Code. So it's the fastest growing IDE in the mix at this point. I, so I use it. I like it a lot. Mostly because you'll you see what I did there. I typed in code dot and you know and brought it right up. I love that feature. Okay, so it also understands that I have a Palm XML. This is a standard Spring Boot application. Uh, no big deal. Pretty easy stuff. And I have a simple little application here. All right, you can see it says it says uh, Aloha right here. Okay, and I'm going to come down to my command line tool. Maven clean package because as a what we do now in the Java world is we build these fat jar applications right you can still build wars and deploy your war file to WebSphere WebLogic Tomcat JBoss but a lot of people build fat jars now okay and you can see that I have this little fat jar and here let me I'll just open this up here you can see there's the fat jar and you can see it's not very big it's 14 megabytes that's my little fat jar there. But it allows me to do this, java-jar, target, uh, and what was it called? It was called boot demo. All right, I'm running it now. There it's up and it's running. I can say curl localhost 8080. Okay, aloha from Spring Boot there. I can also come to my browser uh, and go to localhost 8080. And watch, you know, I can hit return here. It's a simple little application. It says aloha. And you notice there's a little increment, uh, incrementing value here that shows me the state of the JVM. All right, I want to see if the JVM is being recycled. It's not. This JVM is stable. And I can also see it's unknown, meaning it does not know the server name it's running on yet. And that becomes important soon. But that is the host name of the server. Okay, if we look back here at the code, you can see it's just uh, system.getenv, host name. Okay? All right, so that's pretty straightforward so far. Now, what I can do... Docker images. Okay. You can see I'm also talking to my local Docker daemon. So Docker images, Docker PS, right? And that's basically this crazy thing I'm running over here. So there's a lot running. Okay. It's not just these three things. There's a lot running in the background there. You can kind of see when I said Docker uh, PS there, there's just a ton of stuff running. Okay. I've got a lot of Docker containers running right now. And this just in that little eight gigabyte virtual machine. But what I want to do, I'm going to actually just look at my notes to make sure I do it correctly. We're going to build this and run this. Okay. 
so we're going to yeah let's do this real quick okay we're gonna OC project create uh, create project new project it's a new project oh, I've lost track uh, there we go uh, okay yeah. cube CTL get namespaces so I'm gonna I basically created a new place inside this guy right here to put my applications it's just a project right so demo right there we're gonna put our application there and then uh, I'll just basically show you what we have here we got the namespace we got the boot application okay we're going to basically then come here and do a docker we want to do a docker build okay this is actually not tonight's presentation I'm kind of just showing you guys some stuff that's kind of more elementary to give you guys a feel for it but a lot of people said they do spring uh, they do kubernetes already so there we go I'm basically doing my docker build I have not done a docker build with this base library before so you can see it's downloading now so good news our network seems to be working I, I, should, I should have thought about that beforehand okay let's kind of move that down there a little bit but you can see the docker build dash t the you know you kind of do it in this fashion right it's just some piece of text slash some other piece of text doesn't really matter and, and then you have a tag <clears throat> like in my case I called it v1 here okay but this actually produces a docker image and that docker image by the way is just like you can export it as a tar file and put it on a USB flash drive or email it to somebody if you want to that's the beauty of having that docker image so it's a little bit like the jar file but the difference now is it's the whole operating system and the Java application in one. So if I look at my Docker file, here's the default Docker file. It's getting from OpenJDK 8. All right, it's gonna it's creating this environment variable here. It's copying the, the that jar file, okay, to this directory, and you can see it's simply adding some uh, flags and then doing java-jar and the name of the jar file so just like what you saw me do earlier except it's doing it within docker now okay is that about done yet well, okay this is kind of a slow network here okay i should have thought about building it if you once you build it once it's cached i haven't built it in this virtual machine yet so come on almost done almost done all right but the next step we'll need to do is we're going to basically do this right here okay so let me do, 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 do. nine steps. Hello, oh, cube files. And let's look at those cube files. Okay, so we're going to use the my boot deployment, which is this guy right here. And notice right here, the image says nine steps awesome my boot v1. So basically, our deployment YAML, which is a Kubernetes metadata descriptor, says I need that specific image, and that's what I'm going to deploy around. And then we have my boot service, and you can see that it says selector my boot here. So this has to de uh, this deployment is super critical, and then the service is how it's exposed to the world, if you will. And that's actually one of the pieces of magic of Kubernetes: the concept that the deployment is separated from the service. Okay, so let's try this over here. Okay, get pods. There, you see that my boot pod coming up there? kubectl get uh, deployment, kubectl get all. And you can actually see a bunch of things happen there when I basically deployed that deployment. I have a pod now, I have a deployment, and I have a replica set. That becomes very important. But all those objects got created for me automatically. And then let me also whoops uh, da, 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 da. let's get our service let's just run this here okay this is just raw Kubernetes stuff here I'm in the wrong directory all right so we now have our service and let's see if this will work for me here this is a little bit tricky watch what happens here okay see that port number right there 32458 so that's what's called a node port uh, in this world so in a regular raw Kubernetes, it doesn't have an external load balancer. Minishift or OpenShift does. It has HAProxy as an external load balancer. But that's how you actually have to refer to that service is 3248. And then you have to have the IP address. So what I'm going to do is do curl. What we have is the IP address, so Minishift IP. 
Let's see that. So curl, dollar. Uh, yep. Mini shift, IP, colon. And then we'll get the rest of this here. And we're going to curl it. So there you go. So remember that Aloha we had earlier? You can see it right now. And notice the my boot. See that name right there? My boot? That's actually the name of the pod. Okay? Right there. So that, so I just kind of gave you the hello world version of how to deploy your Java app into Kubernetes real fast. But this is critical. The pod name, that is the computer name. It looks like, oh, I didn't realize we're off screen here, aren't we? Let's move over a little bit. Okay, is better? All right. So we, so that is my computer name, my host name. This JVM thinks it's running on that computer. Now I can spin up a bunch of these, okay? I just deployed a whole new machine in a few seconds. So when I mentioned earlier, you don't have to wait at all. You don't have to wait at all. You deploy it and see if it works. Okay? Maybe you deploy a bunch of things and see if it works. If it falls apart, maybe you do something with it. Okay? So let's show you a couple more things here. Uh, uh, like, da, 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 da. Oh, this is good. kubectl uh, get deployment. kubectl edit deployment. My boot. All right, I have it set so it runs Visual Studio Code for me for that. I like that a lot too. I want two replicas of this. I want a little load balancing and HA. I don't want just one. Uh, it already came up already, so get pods. I don't want just one version of that Spring application. I want two. Now I have load balancing for free. You get that for free, right? So now I have these two applications. And let's see if I can run this little curl command. Uh, do you see that? You get 50-50 load balancing out of the box. That's kind of just a thing Kubernetes gives you for free. That's the beauty of that service construct talking to the pods. You can have as many pods behind the service as you want, and the pods can be implemented in Python or Java or Go or whatever. It doesn't care. You as the uh, consumer of that service talk to the service. The pod is the implementation behind that service. That was probably the coolest thing that Google did when they gave us this technology. This came from Google, by the way. What I'm showing you came from Google. It came, comes from a decade of research that Google used to run Google at scale. When you, if I was a Google person, I would basically start my presentation of, I'm Burr from Google. We launch two billion containers a week. We think we know what we're doing when it comes to these Linux containers. So we don't think you need two billion, do you? No, you might need 20. <laughs> okay, so so that concept of the service being separate from the pod is incredibly important. It makes all the magic really happen here. All right, but I want to show you a couple other things, right? Uh huh. Uh, the oh well, this a pod is a computer. That's the easiest mental model to get your head around it. Okay. Like this is my pod. <laughs> but it's okay. a highly virtualized computer, and a Ruby gem is more like a jar file or an NPM from Node.js or a PIP if, if you're Python. Okay. Right? So a gem is a great packaging solution for Ruby apps, but yeah. that's just like a Java jar. Okay. All right? and, and a Java jar with Maven coordinates. That's probably a better way to say it. Right? Um, okay? Now, we kind of did this thing here. Let's see... We can have a lot of fun with it. So Kubernetes allows you to do rollouts and rollbacks. You get you get all kinds of cool stuff like that. Uh, and like I said, this is a three-hour course. I'm giving you the very short version of it. Let me see this right here. Okay. So I can do this now. I can come in here. I'm going to grab that pod name. Uh, exec. IT. And maybe this answers your question a little bit more. I just SSH'd into the computer. Okay. I'm now in the machine. I can run top, and you can kind of see there's my Java app running. But it is a little mini Linux machine. It's the easiest way to think of it. Yeah, it's like a cage. Uh, well, it's a definitely a locked down environment. People think of this like a virtual machine, but that's still kind of wrong because it's way smaller than that. Yeah. It's meant to run one process. Okay, it can it, you can run more than one process, but that's a major no no. Just run one process and then spin up a new container, a new pod, you know, with other processes. Okay? So I guess this is a little similar to the CGI kind of the concept. It's a single process. Actually, I'm not, I'm not yeah. 
this particular one is running Debian, okay? Uh, but I can come in here and look at the memory. I can look at the disk space. It's like I'm dealing with a Linux computer. This is Docker, though, right? This, you guys all saw Docker. You're like, oh, this is easy stuff. But there's a critical element that we should show you, all right? Uh, dun, dun, dun. What I want to do, let's see here. I want to I want to change things up just a little bit. Resources, okay? I want to apply this deployment, and the deployment is called my boot. All right. Uh, so kubectl. Let's see if this will work. Uh, cube files and my boot deployment. Let's see if this will work for me. Can I be a replace? Let me do it. Make sure I get this right. Q and pods. Okay, what? So I basically replaced the previous deployment descriptor with a new one. And this deployment descriptor is actually pretty important. I just want to show you this one little trick. Because what it's going to do, it's going to apply constraints to that to that JVM, to that memory, uh, the memory of the computer, if you will. So basically it's now saying that computer that I was just running has I requested uh, 300 megs of RAM, okay, and a quarter of a CPU. It can scale up to 400 megs of RAM and a whole CPU. And this becomes important because Kubernetes uses that data to determine how to schedule that pod around a cluster of servers. So if you have 25 machines you're running this on, it'll look for the one that has availability of what's requested. Who has enough memory to run this? Who has enough memory to run that? Who has enough CPU to run this? This is incredibly important when you have a mixed modal kind of application, meaning your cluster runs uh, Kafka over here, your Spring Boot application over there, your database over here. They all have different memory constraints and CPU requirements. But the good news is you can specify that and run all those different types of workloads across your cluster as long as you specify what you need. And the scheduler makes it happen for you. The scheduler also will move things based on load and availability too, right? You, you can actually get really fancy with your scheduler. Uh, it has auto scaling capability. It also self heals. If something, if something fails and dies, it actually brings it back to life. So let's see if we can show you that real quick. Okay. Uh, let's see here, kubectl get pods. We should have all our pods. All right, there's our pod up and running again. Notice it's down to one pod because the replicas here is one. Okay, so it's going back to the original state we declared it to be in. Uh, and now, let's see here. Okay, not that. Uh-huh. See if this works for me. Uh, okay, but I got to remember the URL for it. Where'd that Java code go? It is called configure calling another consume sys resources. It is sys resources. Oh, I moved it. Sorry, <laughs> it's no longer running on 8080. I closed that down. All right, so if we go back over here, where's our little curl command and slash sys resources? Okay. Look what happened there. So what this is doing is it's calling sys resources. If you you guys are here, all Java people, right? Yeah. So what the what I did in Java is I said, hey, runtime, what's your available memory and your available processors? Okay, by max memory here, it's your max heap. So this is the heap that's available to you. This is really important. So you guys, if you get nothing else from tonight, you're like, okay, I gotta remember this thing. Because look what happens. When I basically ask the JVM for its resources, it says, oh. You got two CPUs and you get a, you know, almost two, two gigabytes of RAM. That's because it's applying the mathematics to what you see in the virtual machine. Eight gigs of RAM for the virtual machine, the entire cluster, and two cores. The JVM was built before there was Docker, before there was Kubernetes, before there was virtualization. The virtual machine, in the case of Java virtual machine, thinks it has access to the entire computer's resources even when it doesn't, okay? So that's a key thing to understand. Um, and so let's see if we can kind of check this out. Is that a prayer going on? No? Yeah. Okay. Let's see here. Okay.
Okay. Oh, actually, do I have the... Let's see, this, will this polar work? Uh, by boot, shift. Let's see, we're... No, not that. Why does that polar not work? I'm curious. Mini shift IP. QCDO gets serves my boot. Oh, not my space. I put it in demo. That's part of the problem. All right. Okay, so we're polling. We're polling that endpoint there. We're talking to it. Let's actually go dig around in it a little bit. Uh, actually, let's do this real quick. Yeah. Let's have a little fun. Okay, I'm going to call this up here. Let's call that sys resources again. I didn't spell that right. Hold on. Oh, I did. Okay. Now, all we're going to do now is call a certain method on this piece of Java code called consume. And what it's going to do is it's going to take the max memory and it's going to build an immutable string and simply use up to 80% of that memory. Okay, so this is something that's kind of important. It's just going to try to use the memory that it thinks it has. And watch what happens. And actually, let's do this real quick. Watch QTTL get pods. All right, there we go. Okay, we killed it. And it's OM killed. Oh, wait, it's running again. Well, it's not quite running again. <laughs> now it's running again. So this is an important concept. I mentioned earlier that Kubernetes by default tries to self-heal. It saw that if the system died, the JVM died, the JVM tried to use more memory than was allocated, and at the Linux kernel level, there's this thing called C groups, control groups, and C groups is really what makes that thing work. That's what makes Docker work, that's what makes Kubernetes work, that's really what's constraining that process to have access to only certain resources. And we said you only have access to a certain amount of memory, you only have access to so many CPUs. When we tried to go beyond our memory limit, C groups, the Linux kernel said, kill it! You went bad. It killed it, but Kubernetes said, holy crap, it died. Bring it back to life. <laughs> and so you can see it came back to life, but you notice I had error messages. So we can spend a lot of time talking about it. There's, you, there's a way to fix all the error messages, too. So Kubernetes has a solution for that. It's called a liveness probe and a readiness probe. You make sure you have those in your, in your uh, deployment YAML and in your Java code, and therefore it ensures that the JVM starts properly. It ensures that the JVM is warmed up nicely. If you have to connect to a database, you do that. If you have to go populate a cache, you do that. Then you're ready to take user traffic, but not before. And this becomes really important when you're doing a rolling upgrade, right? It won't tear down the old one until the new one is ready. And I actually, one of the demos I do sometimes is I actually show how we take all the memory from one and move it to the other. So while the old one is alive, as the new one comes to life, it takes all his memory, okay, and then it tears it down, and this new one basically looks like nothing happened from a user standpoint. So that was with an in-memory session, shopping cart kind of thing, okay? So there's a lot of cool things you can do. But notice it's running now, and again, if I go over here and hit consume again, watch closely down here, okay, you'll see it goes, it'll go dead. Oh, oh, I'm killed. Out of memory, killed, right? And then it's going to try to bring it back to life. Sometimes it takes a second. Let's see. That first time it went really fast. This one looks like it's a little slower. Uh, but obviously you shouldn't be killing it. Okay, so it's trying. There we go. And you notice how it says running, but it's still giving me errors? That's because I don't have the liveness probe set correctly. Okay? Again, you can fix that. But there it's back to running, and you can see it starts back at 1. The JVM got completely recycled. The whole computer died and got restarted. Now I've had compute. I've had managers tell me so. Software development managers. There are no managers in the room, right? We're all real workers here. Okay. Okay. The managers won't come out at night. They're drinking. Okay. They're all drinking. So I've had managers tell me they love this feature because their programmers write code that's really bad. It uses all its memory and blows up. Okay. Or better yet, you forget how to use a try catch finally block and you don't put the threads back in the thread pool. How many people have done that before? You eat all the connections in the connection pool, or you eat all the threads in the thread pool, and what happens to the application? It stops responding. So that's the better part. It looks like it's running. The memory's fine, the CPU's fine, but it doesn't respond anymore, so users are getting errors. And timeouts. 
the good news the good news is about Elijah's probe, Brandon's probe, it gets that, it fixes that too. Because if it doesn't respond, Kubernetes goes, doesn't respond anymore. I'll shoot it in the head, start a new one. Okay? So you can write really bad code. Uh, all right, so let's do this. Let's go here. And by the way, I was showing you kind of the manual to do this. Okay, this is what we were creating this over here, plus all these other components, right? The deployments, the services. Uh, and then you can also do the same thing by pointing and clicking. Okay, now this is specific to OpenShift, not Kubernetes, but you can point and click it. But we're not going to worry about that. We're going to just delete that whole thing. All right, we're going to just delete it and wipe it out. Okay, now let's show you this guy here. So the same thing has occurred. We've deployed customer preference and recommendation. Three microservices where customer calls preference, preference calls recommendation. And if I come over here, dun, 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 I have a little polar script for that. We can, there you go. You can kind of see it's customer preference recommendation. And let me look at this code here. You can see I use that little that little code dot trick a lot. I love that. All right, so we're going to come in here and change this where it says recommendation. We're going to say hola recommendation. Okay. Uh, and we're going to come in here. And actually, this is version 2. Let's call this v2. And I'm going to change the log as well. All right, so this is the hola v2. Uh, two. All right. So there, I made my Java change. This, by the way, is Vertex code. So Vertex is a reactive programming toolkit for the JVM. Super tiny, super fast. And it works if you're familiar with Node.js. It looks like Node.js, doesn't it? That's where the programming model came from. So it sets up a declarative router like that. Uh, let's, uh, yeah, we leave that running. Let's do a Maven clean package. We're compiling that Java file. Uh, there it is, java-jar, just like you saw me do earlier, recommendation, start super fast. Notice how fast it started there, because it's actually based on Netty, not Tomcat. But there you go, you can see my Ola v2. Okay, so my Java application looks good. I do, let me do Docker images. And Docker images, rep, uh, example. Docker build dash T example recommendation v2 dot. I think I did that right. I noticed the image is already cached, so my build went really fast. Okay, and now I have the version two. So I need to now do my little deployment. I keep a little copy. By the way, what I'm showing you now is completely documented. All the stuff I'm showing you is completely documented in those two presentations I talked about. So I'm not showing you anything that isn't documented. Uh, so you can follow this on your own, but I'm going to just copy and paste this guy here. Boom. And let me be in the right project first. Good. All right. So QNS. All right. Right. All right. There we go. And if we watch, get kubectl, get pods. Okay. Watch what's happening here. See, it says one of two. It says running, but it doesn't show up down here yet because this one has a liveness probe and readiness probe. It's smart. Now it's up. So if you notice, if you were quite careful there, you saw it running, but it had one of two, then it went to two of two. And that's because there are two containers now running in this pod. You can actually have more than one container running in a pod. And notice it's now load balancing across those two changes. I have recommendation version one and recommendation version two. Okay? So that's, you know, kind of what we're going to get into this here in a second. But, uh, you know, so that process, hopefully, does that process make sense? That the way you basically build and deploy an application? And again, there's lots of ways to do it, but that's like the most, that's the hardest way to do it, what I showed you, the worst case scenario, okay? All right, so let's get into here. It's already 8.30, good God, we got, we got three more hours to go, <laughs> okay? So microservices are fundamentally about distributed computing. Your operating system and your JVM runs a service, and that service might call another service, which might call another service across the network. The problem is the fallacies of distributed computing. The network is not reliable. Latency is never zero. Bandwidth is never infinite. Yet we write applications all the time that acts like that is not true. And that's why it messes up, and we don't quite know what's wrong. You have a race condition across the network. It is impossible to figure out what's going on. And so we have to think about what happens with a failure of a service. Okay? So if that service failure happens there, what is it a cascading failure? Does it blow up the whole chain? And that's what we want to avoid, okay? 
So you think of these microservice LDs. These are the things you should think about. How do I build my new API in Go or Python or Java or Spring Boot or Vertex? It doesn't matter. You've got to think about your new API creation, gRPC, REST with JSON, SOAP and WSDL and XML. That's what you want. That's your responsibility. But then you have to figure out how to discover it, how to find it, where is it, how to invoke it. Is it elastic? Does it scale out or scale back? Is it resilient? What happens if it's failing? How do I respond to failure? What's my pipeline for deploying it? My authentication authorization, logging, monitoring, tracing. These are all key elements, okay? This is a short history of microservices. <laughs> you can kind of see on my far left, I talk about extreme programming and continuous integration. This is where we start thinking about more modular smaller application development teams and smaller pieces of software. That's where the Agile Manifesto came from in 2001. And of course the cloud was born in 2006. We see Drop Wizard and Node-X, Vertex, were born in 2011. So that fat jar thing I was just showing you, it came about in 2011. It's not a new thing, it's been around a long time. Netflix open sourced Ribbon, Histrix, Eureka in 2012. Microservices became a term in 2012. Docker was born in 2013. Kind of zoom in here. Spring Boot born in 2013. Microservices officially defined in 2014, and Kubernetes born in 2014. The point of this is that was the perfect storm when all of this came together. Linux containers, Kubernetes are running at scale, fat jar architecture for us Java people with Drop Wizard and Spring Boot and Vertex and things like that, and Netflix showed us how to do distributed computing for the first time. And they open sourced their technology and gave it to us in 2012. That's when the magic really started to happen. Okay? So we actually had a world that looked like this. We could build in Netflix world, we had a JVM running our application with Eureka, with Ribbon, with Histrix, with Zipkin, right? You know, with Prometheus, whatever you put in there. You stuck those libraries in your application. If you're a Spring user, that was your Spring Cloud annotations. Okay? So that's what we did. The problem is that's Java only. And that's great if you're a Java person, like this gentleman is what you're on. <laughs> okay? So if you think of those illities right there, Kubernetes or OpenShift had a had a significant augmentation term, right? So Kubernetes gave us discovery for free. You don't have to do you don't need a Eureka for discovery. You get it with Kubernetes out of the box. You get an invocation, elasticity. Right, up, right away. You don't have to do anything for that. Logging, monitoring, come from OpenShift, pipeline there. Okay, so keep those things in mind. And now we're going to bring you Istio. Istio is a new Greek term, means sail, like a sail on a sh sailing ship. Kubernetes, Kubernetes, by the way, means like a helmsman or a pilot or a governor. Does that nautical term make sense? Do you know why they're the, you know why it's nautical and sailing and Vessels and boats. Okay? A lot of people don't know why it's boats. It's because of this. You guys seen this before? That's a boat. The containers sit on a boat. And you know why we call it a pod? A pod is a family of whales. Okay? So that's where that term came from. Uh, so that logo has a lot to do with it. This is, by the way, inside stuff no one really knows. So you guys, you guys can go tell your mom and be her trivia pursuit. Okay. All right. So the service mesh technology is a new application layer, infrastructure layer for your application. It sits above Kubernetes and gives you some new capabilities. So if you think of our chart here earlier, you see Istio now augments authentication, tracing, monitoring, and discovering. Okay. So before Istio, it looked like this. After Istio, it looks like this. You don't have those jar files anymore. You don't have to have them in your application any longer. You have a sidecar container because a pod can have more than one container. We never thought of that before, but you know, earlier when I showed you two slash two, that's the sidecar in there also. And so the sidecar means that you can move that logic out away from your business logic and put it back in the infrastructure where it belongs. Okay? So the sidecar intercepts all traffic. If you're familiar with Linux, it basically manipulates IP tables, okay? That's how the magic works. And the good news is you can basically remove Eureka, Ribbon, 
the Spring Config Server, Zool, Histrix, you don't need those things anymore. As a matter of fact, we replaced Zipkin by basically putting in Open Tracing and now Istio with Jaeger. And the good news is it works with any programming language. Anything that runs in Linux. C Sharp runs in Linux now. Did you guys know that? Okay. So Go, Python, Perl, whatever. Envoy is the current sidecar. That's the implementation. Okay. And it means you can do really interesting stuff. And I want to show you some interesting stuff. Let's just show it to you. All right. And are you guys coming up with some tweets for me, by the way? Let's see here. Oh, look, there's a good photo. <laughs> okay. And actually, let's see if that shows up correctly here. There we go. So those are three in this in that, that particular search. We're going to use a different search, though. Let's come back. Let's try that other search. Where is it at? Uh-huh. Is it over here? Oh, wait. I left it over here. We're going to use a different search. Yeah, spring run. This is another little application that we have. But this will be our official one. So there, that's just a way to search for it. This will be our official one. Uh, Java Cube. There we go. So there's some. We're, we're going to check this out here in a second. All right. Fantastic. Got a photo in there. I like the photos. That'll help you win. Okay. Uh, and you can see this one picked this one right here. All right. So that would be our winner if we were running it right now. And also, they and it follows me true. So that's a good one too. Okay. All right. So we're we're going to come back and pick winners in a second. Uh, let's close that down. All right. Okay, so let's show you what we've done here. You saw me earlier. I had the two going back and forth. I have, uh, you can see, customer preference recommendation, customer preference recommendation. Okay? Yeah, come on there. There we go. All right. It's a little slow because i got too much running on this computer. But I want to show you a couple of things real quick. Here. Okay, let's go look at Grafana. Bring that up. Go look at this thing called Kiali, bring that up, and we'll go look at tracing. Okay, so Grafana has a workload dashboard. So as part of my application, oh, it's not seeing it. My Grafana is not behaving correctly. Let's see if my other guys are behaving correctly. This is Kiali. Because of that, uh, sidecar I mentioned earlier, out of the box you get some immediate traceability. Okay, so recommendation, let's see here, and so here's traceability, right? So it knows, so by default you get these things kind of for free. It knows that customer calls preference calls recommendation, as an example. Why is my Grafana not running though? Dun, 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 dun. Mesh dashboard. It's like I might have, I might have killed Grafana. Hmm. I know what I know what I did. So I'm actually pushing this machine a little too hard, and I suspect one of these guys died here, and it needs to be restarted correctly. So I'm gonna just have a little fun with it. Let's see if we can fix it real fast. All right, we're gonna scale that down, and let's scale Prometheus down, and and because there's a couple demos I want to show you. I'll bring that one back up. Bring that one back up. So I'm completely restarting those processes. We'll see if that gets us where we need to be. Uh, and then we'll come back to this in a second. Oop. All right, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a second. We'll come back to that in a second. You can see this thing's gotten really slow here. It's not even polling correctly hardly anymore. <laughs> okay, we'll come back to that. So here's the, here's the point of that, though. We basically deployed our application. kubectl, get deployments, okay, there's the recommendation v2 that I deployed earlier, uh, right here, kubectl, edit, uh, deployment, recommendation, v2, if I did that right, should bring up my Visual Studio code, here's the deployment, now, the deployment should be what, what I basically had before, right, you can see it's the namespace, gives it a name, there's the image and the JVM settings. Kind of see that there. You can see there's a, a liveness probe. And there should be the image name in here someplace. 
dun 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 where is it there it is example recommendation two but you notice there's a ton of other things in here now because now the envoy sidecar is here okay so basically we've injected a bunch of extra capabilities the service mesh wrapped around what was our simple deployment earlier is now wrapped around the sky and it's basically looking to make the magic happen so that we get uh, we get a lot of capabilities okay I'm just gonna let it go back and forth for a second and dun, 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 dun. Uh, yeah, we'll close that down. All right. Let's go here. I have some scripts here. I just want to show you a little bit about this. So let's basically scale up. Let's see if it'll let us scale up. Let's try to run two recommendations of version two. Okay. Notice there's a second version two coming online now. See where it says one of two there? And we should see two of two, assuming I have enough resources. There we go. All right, now notice what's happening. We have one version one and two version twos. Do you guys see that? One, two, two. One, two, two. That's what, that's what Kubernetes does by default. Okay? So I can basically scale that back. Uh, I'm just running little scripts here. You can kind of see what it's doing. Cube, cuddle, cube, control, scale, replicas, one. So you're going to notice that that one that I just started is terminating, and it goes back to... One, two, one, two, one, two. That's the standard Kubernetes stuff. Okay? Now let's make it a little bit more interesting. Let's make it all version one. So look what I did there. So even though version two is running, hey, version, there's a version two running, the user doesn't see version two at all anymore. So this is kind of one of the things you get from uh, service mesh and Istio right away, is you can change the behavior of the application without changing the way the, the application is deployed. That makes sense. The application is still deployed. It's still out there. And now you can think of it like a canary deployment. I have made a change, put it in production, and now but my users don't see that at all. They're only seeing the version 1. Okay? Uh, if I come over here, I can now roll it out incrementally. Whoop. I can roll it out incrementally. I can now say that 25% of the time, I'm going to see version 2. So basically what I said is I'm going to I'm running this Istio control command and I'm using this thing called a virtual service and I'm going to say that 25% of the time and it's random by the way it's not an even load balancing we saw earlier 25% of the time you're going to see version 2. This allows to be roll it out. Now what this means is I'm testing in production. What if something's wrong with that application? What if it's using too much memory? What if it's eating too much CPU? What if the marketing team comes back and says get that OLED thing out of there? Stop! You can remove it very easily. Okay? So, dun, 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 dun. so go back to version 1, and we're back to version 1. Okay? So I removed it. It's gone now. But it's still running. The user just doesn't see it. So I can do something a little bit more creative than that. What if I, what if I want only Safari users to see it? Okay? So let's, let's look here. Dun, dun, dun. Let's see here. Let's expand this. Uh, nope. No, 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 no. Let's see. Okay, so echo. Dun, 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 dun. Let's see if that'll expand for me. Right, that's all I needed was for it to expand. That's all. Okay. Uh, and let's go here to my Firefox. Okay. Firefox is seeing all version 1. Okay. Let's go to Safari. And it's seeing version two. Now this is a, this is actually you know you might be thinking well this is kind of what is that for? In my canary rollout world, I'm trying to build applications very quickly. Your application code that you pr check in the source code repository adds no value, has no value until it lands in production. Your mission as a software developer is to get production to production as fast as possible. That way you learn and see how it behaves. So you use a canary rollout. Or the canary means we can push it to production. Do you guys know where the, the word canary comes from? Okay. Well, maybe not everybody. I, this gentleman with the Java shirt does. So the canary is a little yellow bird. Okay. <laughs> the canary is a little yellow bird. And you take the little yellow bird into the coal mine. All right. There you go. 
you take the yellow bird into the coal mine. That's a good little picture right there. Whoa. All right. And see the little yellow bird? So you have a little pet now that's like a little animal. That's awesome. But more importantly, if you're digging way down under the earth into the coal mine, there's a lot of poisonous gases that you'll find way down in the belly of the earth. Okay? Uh, and guess what happens? The canary dies before you do. If you see the canary stop singing, fall off the perch, you get the hell out of the coal mine. Okay? That is the point. So we call this the canary deployment. And the idea is we want to have something die before we all die. Okay? It's kind of the point. So in this case, I know I don't have a lot of Safari users, so let me roll the canary to the Safari users and see if it's okay. I can monitor its um, me uh, memory usage, CPU usage. I can monitor Twitter to see if people are complaining about it, you know? Okay? And so you would do this with, like, rolling things out to, um, instead of rolling it out to Mexico, your primary market where your main customers are, you roll it out to Canada. Okay? You don't really have customers in Canada. You don't care if you piss them off. Okay? Uh, this is what big startup companies do. They actually have a rollout to New Zealand before they go to Australia. They roll out to Canada before they come to the U.S. Because there are fewer people. And if they upset a few people, that's okay. But it allows them to test this idea. So I roll it out to Safari, or maybe only Android users, or only Android users to have an LG phone, or maybe only logged in, can, you know, authenticated employees. Employees have to suffer first. Or maybe only customers with a beta checkbox. They agree to a beta test. It doesn't matter. You determine what that canary rule is, but now you can roll it out in a really interesting way. So okay? Is yes? Is there any way to set the hotspot in the root to create the strategy? So the canary strategy is, in this case, based on simple little rules in these YAML files. And I can show you what those look like. Uh, there's, there, if you look at... Um, What's it called? Concourse. There's a, so, so there's different CI/CD tools that are trying to basically make it, you know, automated now. Uh, but these are just YAML files. Like if I go here, where'd that piece of code go? Uh, here. Uh, okay. Let me find the right place. These are just little YAML files. Let's make sure we open these guys up. So, so you need a de you need a destination rule, and that basically says we can go between one and two. That's what the rule says. I can go between one and two, and then you'll have like this Safari one. Where'd it go? Right here. Okay. So basically, if it's Safari, everybody goes to version two. Otherwise, go to version one. And then you can also do weighted load balancing. What you saw me do earlier with the 25%, or right, let's we can just pick any percentage. So I want 50-50. I want 75, 25. So these are just little YAML files. You can check into your source code repository, and then you can apply them at runtime if you want, and you can apply them at the end of a continuous delivery type build using Jenkins if you want, right? It's just a script that you have to run. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then let's just kind of run a couple more things here. Oh, in the wrong directory. I got I got one more really super cool thing to show you. So let's make sure we get to that. Let's clean out our canary. Let's do a dark launch instead. Okay. Now watch what happens. This is kind of very powerful. If, if hopefully it'll work for me here. Look what happens. My users are only seeing version one. My system is very overtaxed right now, so it's going too slow. My users are only seeing version 1, yet my version 2 and 1 are both being executed. So in this case, nobody sees the canary. We call that the dark launch. The most famous dark launch in history was uh, Facebook. Facebook, when they rolled out Facebook Messenger, you guys remember getting Messenger? So on the day they rolled it out, they went to half a billion users. And people were like, how do you go from zero to half a billion users? And Because they didn't. They previously rolled it out a year earlier than the day you knew about it. So a dark launch is you launch. You're in production. 
So when you don't see it until the marketing decides to let you see it. That's what this idea is. It's a canary deployment that nobody sees, and you're just monitoring its behavior. That's exactly what Facebook did. They wanted to see if they could scale it. They basically sampled transactions from your browser and shoved data through that system for a year before they actually did the marketing and made it visible. Okay? So the marketing is when it becomes comes to the light. They refer to the dark light. So that's also a very powerful concept. And uh, this could go on and on and on. <laughs> so let's jump back over here real quick into our applications. It's not that one again. I keep going to that one. Not that one. I would make. I should just make this easier on myself, shouldn't I? Uh, not that one. I do too many presentations. Here we go. I want to know if my Grafana came back to life correctly. No, oh, Grafana's dead. I killed a lot of things today. Okay, I really have. I've whacked a lot of stuff. So we'll come back. I can fix it, but I just don't have time to fix it right now. So let's go back over here. Okay, you can kind of see there, again, there's our recommendation one and two. There's the two pods we talked about. Of course, if I want to come down here and drill down on these logs, okay. Let's see here. Is it still polar? Oh, I stopped the polar. There we go. You can see it right there, okay. So version two is still being polled. Can I see it? Um, so that's a very powerful concept. Did you have a question, sir? Okay. All right. So let's show you a couple other things. Uh, we could go on and on here, right? So let's just kind of cut that out. I'm going to do something else. Are you guys still with me or are you getting bored? You can say, we're bored. Uh, and like I said, I normally do this for three hours. It, it is a three-hour kind of presentation. Okay? So the... Um, the control plane is using something called Istio Pilot, Istio Mixer, Istio Citadel. You saw me kind of messing around with the Grafana and the Prometheus and all that. That's where those things live in this control plane. It's in a namespace called Istio System, and they're the controlling tools, if you will, the universal tools that kind of then help you build your application or help you manage your application. Your application sits up here, what they call the data plane. And so HTTP 1.1, HTTP 2, gRPC, or TCP with TLS, can come into your component. Your application basically is none the wiser that someone's stealing its packets. So that's the part that's making the magic happen. Your application is having its packets stolen and redirected. It doesn't even know. Okay? And then so the sidecar is doing that. And when you have service A called B, it's going through the sidecar again out to the other service. So all the ingress and e oh, so ingress and egress go through the sidecar. Right. Yes, sir. So say so you have five pods in one node. Would it make sense to run an indoor sidecar on each floor, or would you rather run one single sidecar? Right. So if you guys understand the question, it seems to be more efficient if we just have one of these instead of three of these. Now, these guys are very small. A little C++ code is all it is. And it's only architected to work at a per pod level, so just like you see here right now. Uh, though people are definitely exploring the option of having one versus the three and have it at the node level. Okay? So you can do this with things like Linkerd and something called traffic, and they run more at the node level, if you know what I mean, as opposed to the in the pod level. So you're going to have different capabilities, though. So right now this is definitely in the pod. Yes, sir. One important thing is that it's to prevent single point of failure. That's the reason that you need one uh, sidecar per pod. Yeah, because if the sidecar and the node failed, you'd have to take the whole node offline. Mm -hmm. Which is certainly possible. Yes, ma'am. So, yeah, so your application is completely ignorant. Okay. Or it has no idea these things even exist. It's like APM? APM? Mm -hmm. um, yes. And, and here's why. Uh, yeah, I think I, I, if I understand what you mean, here's why. So you see this little sidecar right here? Okay. It's just a second container 
uh, describe deployment my uh, recommendation. All right. Okay. You can kind of see what happens here. It basically just has this little bit of Istio stuff that gets added to it right here. Okay. Uh, see the local bin envoy? That got added automatically. You weren't even aware that it was added. Okay. And and you and the and the crazy part is if we look at the Java code. Uh, Istio tutorial customer. And you can kind of see, by the way, you, uh, we have lots of implementations of this. So here's a Node.js implementation, a .NET implementation. In Java, you have MicroProfile, Spring Boot. You know, um, that's the nice thing. It doesn't matter how you write your code anymore, right? So let's, let's just look at the Spring Boot version. So here's the Spring Boot version of, of, of customer. And let's make this a little bit bigger. Come on. Okay. See, it basically just refers to preference, the remote URL. It's just preference. It doesn't know anything else. It just calls it. And if you look at the code for it, it is just the uh, REST template get for entity. Stand, you just make a standard Java call to the other thing. Mm -hmm. And you can see there's a couple, you, you probably have some exceptions you want to catch. Like, and you should catch your exceptions, right? That's good Java programmers. <laughs> but, but that's it. So your Java code is unaware the sidecar was injected and pilot instead of done all that it does. That's the part I'm most excited about when it comes to this technology. It makes your code cleaner and easier to read. Okay. Okay. Uh, but that's a good point. The all right. Let's kind of walk through this real quick. So the blue green deployment just to kind of give it a visual version of it. You have your your code you checked into your source code repository, your Git repo, your SVN, whatever it might be. Visual source safe, right? Yeah. Um, it produces a build that goes through development, QA, staging, lands into production. Notice though our router is pointing to blue. It lands on green and watch what happens. Our router goes to green. Okay? So you have two versions of the application running in, in production. But this allows you to ensure that if anything fails, if for some reason green is using too much memory, producing weird error messages, you know, the, cut, the marketing department hates the new user interface, you can roll it right back. You go back to blue. So that's the nature of a blue-green deployment. Super easy with Kubernetes. You kind of just saw how I did all kinds of crazy stuff there. And the canary deployment, again, based on this principle, means it's a smaller change. It lands in production for a small subset of users. And if you use the dark launch technique in Istio, it's for no users, if you know what I mean. The users don't see it. And then it grows over time until you either decide you want to shrink it or grow it. That's it. All users get it or no users get it. You just keep rolling it out. You roll it out. Uh, again, if Mexico is your primary customer base, you roll it out to Vietnam first because you only have two customers in Vietnam. You don't care if you piss them off. <laughs> and then you roll it out to Thailand and then to Australia. Right? If you're a big bank, this is kind of what you're, you know, maybe Australia. Or maybe I know when those customers show up. They show up at 9 o'clock in the morning on Monday because that's when the check goes in, right? But the cool thing about these ideas is you'll be able to deploy every Thursday at, at 9 o'clock in the morning if that's what you want. You can deploy every Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning with these kinds of techniques. Not on Friday night and work all weekend to hopefully the deployment works. Okay, so that's the idea. So with Kubernetes, the canary deployment model or the, uh, the blue-green deployment model is based on the pod count. If you have two pods, 50-50. If you have three pods, 33, 33, 34. If you have four pods, 25, 25, 25, 25. But in the case of Istio, you can actually just with two pods, say one's 10%, the other's 90. One's 1%, 1 the other's 99, okay? Everything I've been showing you, by the way, is in the bit.ly Istio tutorial. It's all documented. It'll take you probably eight hours or more to go through all that content. It's a huge book we've been creating online. Uh, this, I'll tell you right now, even though I brought these for you guys, this is actually old because anything you put on paper is old. So Christian and I have to go uh, update this book now and um, get, it, get it up to date. But you can still read the book for context. You can download the book and it gives you some contextual information. But you'll see that whenever we have to, whenever we have to up, do an update... I try to make sure the team is always updating this resource here. Okay. You can see Kamesh was the last person, person uh, merger request. Looks like this. 
And then you can basically see everything I showed you. You can deploy your microservices, customer preference recommendation, how to get monitoring and tracing working, routing, advanced routing. There's chaos engineering and fault injection and lots of amazing stuff there. Okay. Uh, but. I got a couple more things I want to show you. You guys still have a few more minutes? Yeah. Uh, anybody have to get home to the babysitter? You can say yes. <laughs> but I do thank you guys for coming out. I know it's the middle of the night for you. And I can tell you that around the globe, it is hard to get people to come out at night. Because we're well-paid software people, right? That means we can go drinking instead of going to user groups. That's why we brought the beer to you. Okay? Or more importantly, I know here in Mexico City, I bet this is true. How many people have children? Let's show hands. Okay. Children? Babies? Okay. Not many people have children. <laughs> Mine are old. My youngest is 21. I'm an old guy. But here's, uh, but here's how we used to think of it like in Atlanta. On Thursday night, you had football practice. You had to go coach. I coached soccer for 14 years, okay, for girls. I coached hundreds of girls uh, up from age 4 to age 18. When my girls at 18, they would rock your world. <laughs> they would beat anybody in this room. <laughs> but, you know, so I had to do that too. And I respect the fact that you have other things to do at night, whether it be coaching soccer or karate or Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or, you know, whatever it is. Or I know... You're at home watching uh, whatever Desperate Housewives is now. <laughs> the, real, the real Housewives of Mexico City, right? <laughs> Did they have that? I, I don't know. Because in the U.S., that's, there's like eight of those silly things now. It's like, where'd this show come from? <laughs> so I see that. I see people like, no, i got to watch TV. It's like, okay. We know where you're spending your time. All right, I want to show you this. So this is... You know, this is all the stuff we were running earlier. We're going to just let that be. I want to show you something else. Let's go here. I want to show you another idea. Okay? I actually have a picture. Let's see if I can find a picture. Uh, is it 2018 Next Gen? Is that the URL I gave it? Okay, so this is a presentation I did earlier and the demonstration I did for Red Hat earlier today. Uh, as you can see, oh, well, I can show you this real quick. Okay, you guys will like this. This is what I'm when I'm talking about DevOps. I make this point. <laughs> you can't throw it over the wall anymore. And 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 as a matter of fact, software development and deployment should not look like this. Have you guys have, put, have the phrase pushing the rock uphill, pushing the stone uphill? It sounds hard, right? You got to push this stone up a hill. It's hard. The problem is in software, we don't have a nice stone. We have a blob. <laughs> okay? And we have this gang of people pushing on it to try to move it along. And you notice some people are kind of pushing the wrong direction. <laughs> and for my developers, you're thinking, oh, that's my operations people, right? <laughs> or my security people. Well, I'll tell you, it's really the DBA. <laughs> no, I'm not changing the schema. No schema change. Okay? Now, who's this person up here? This is your architect. <laughs> <laughs> they're, trying to, they're trying to ride the blob, you know? <laughs> because they're in charge. And for those of you who don't have architects, you have a manager. Okay? Notice they're facing the wrong way. You know, they have their butt to the world there. How about this person out here? So for, for my developers in the room, I'm here to tell you that's our operations person. Being crushed under the weight of this crap you created. <laughs> and here's the part that's really bad. We have to deploy <laughs> again and again and again. And, and they, here's the part that's funny. This sucks so much. We only do it every two months, right? We only do this every three months. And it takes all weekend. And people have to perform heroes and cowboys and super heroes, right, to make it work in production. And it shouldn't be that way, okay? It shouldn't be that way going forward. It should look more like this. 
small team working on a cohesive piece of tight software that's ready to roll to production. You always got to push something uphill. Nothing's free or easy, but if you can make it tight and right, you can get it to production ever faster. And you can do it with a smaller team that's all working together, okay? So you got to have dev and ops working together, hand in hand, to deliver that software together. Uh, and this is just charts I show in different presentations. I'll show you one other thing I didn't show today. Uh, where is it? Okay, here it is. You guys are just getting all my tricks here. Here's another version of that uh, chart I did earlier. Okay, so that's your evolutionary process. But it's really a bunch of superpowers if you think about it. That's really the goal. That's how I look at all technology. I don't adopt any technology unless it gives me a new superpower. I don't have time to learn it. I don't have time to travel and talk about it unless I truly feel that's awesome. And it makes me more awesome, makes you more awesome. And that's how I think about it. Uh, but let's show you this. Okay? It's not about just dev and ops. Okay? Like my ops person, she loves Harry Potter. Okay? My developer loves Star Wars. My security team loves Star Trek. And that's okay. Okay? And you see my DBA down there? I'm not saying they're a zombie. I'm not saying they're the walking dead. I'm saying they love The Walking Dead. You guys love The Walking Dead, right? Yeah. And the key point is, we're all geeks together now. Did you guys see Black Panther? Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. Okay? So we love this stuff. The, what's the most popular TV show in the world? Big Bang Theory. All right? We love this stuff. And we're all geeks together. And so there's got to be a place you guys can go get all dressed up together and go to your local comic convention Okay, or maybe it's the Day of the Dead that's coming up. But you get to all, all right, we get to all dress up, right? And it's, what's more important, you have to think about diversity across all the cast of characters we have. And this is critical across the world that we have to be thinking about this. There are people with additional superpowers that we have to bring into our software development process and embrace all of these superpowers. It's critical that we think about all of these superheroes that are part of our organization, whether it be they look like this or they look like this. Because it doesn't matter, okay? We need to work together to build better software faster. All right, that's kind of the point of this. I love I love Trinity here for the Matrix. <laughs> she's, she's totally badass, right? Um, and we got Storm over there, you know, for from the X Men. Okay. I, and actually, the original first one we did was Princess Leia and Hermione. Um, so I have a designer that I work with. And I said, okay, here's what I want. You know, he did a really great job with that. Uh, I also am married to my designer. That helps a little bit. <laughs> okay? But I'll just show you that to give you a little perspective. But I want to show you this other little thing. I want to show you this other little demo to kind of make the point here. This is, I do a lot of different presentations. Okay, here we go. Let me show you this demonstration. Here's the beautiful thing. As I mentioned earlier at the very beginning of the session, you build your applications, you write, you write Java one time, you run it anywhere. With a Kubernetes-based architecture, our distributed microservices can now be run anywhere. Okay, so I have I have Kubernetes or OpenShift running at Amazon, Azure, Google, and on this laptop. And I can actually distribute work across all four clouds if it works. <laughs> okay, so let's try this real quick. I'm gonna have let's go here, up there, here. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna bring this guy online. This is another little Vertex application here. Let's see if it'll get started for me. Give me a warning, it's gonna complain a little bit, let's see. Looks like it's working though. Because this, this computer is really out of resources. I've really pushed it a little too hard here. Uh, but looks like it's gonna come online, there we go. Here's the front end for that. So basically, I'm gonna put in uh, Dara here, send a request. So it says, hola, Dara. All right, so it's a message that goes through my system. It's processed on the Burr cloud. The Burr cloud is the local cloud, the one on this laptop. Okay, notice, though, that I have a bunch of other clouds running here. I have Amazon, Azure, and Google that are also processors. What this means is I can scale out 
from my, my local cloud to any cloud and back again. Okay? If, again, if this works. So here's my Amazon. Yeah, yeah, you're going to get sign me out, but okay. It doesn't matter. Um, let's look here. This is the Amazon console running there. And I have one worker running here. I have the Azure, which has its worker running. I'm just checking to see it's all running. Here's my Google. And there's my worker running. Okay? So I can now distribute transactions across all three clouds. Now, in this case, anything I type in here is simply going to work off my local cloud because this is running on my local server. So we have affinity for running transactions locally by default. Okay? Because that's what you want. You want to run a transaction as close to where it belongs as possible. So if I come over here and kill this, oh wait, that's the wrong one. Let's kill the right one. Uh, let's kill this guy again. Let's start stop them. All right, scale that down. Come over here. Let's put in four. All right. Notice it went to Google. So I killed my local one. It's now going out to Google to run the same transaction. Okay, the same code, the same programming logic. Is basically uh, out there now. If I come over here and take Google offline, I'm taking it down. All right, so we killed Google now, and it goes to Amazon. So my application stays up no matter what cloud is up, as long as at least one cloud can do the transaction. Okay, uh, I'll bring, let's go ahead and bring Google back online, and I'll even bring my local one back online. And I'm going to show you another little console here. Okay, so this is what the topology of my application looks like. Notice there's the number two there. There's two connections connected to my local router, but the, uh, this is actually known as AMQP. Uh, it's an AMQP-based router, so Apache uh, ActiveMQ is the world we live in. Okay, but we like this thing called Artemis right there. And it's, but I'm not using Artemis. I'm using Apache Cupid dispatch router. All right, this guy here. That's really what's making this magic happen. But these are all projects sponsored by Red Hat. We also have Kafka as well. You guys have probably heard of Kafka. But what I'm doing is I'm using this router, and I'm basically making messages flow between these worlds. So let's see if we can do this. Okay. Let's add a little bit of load to this system. Let's see if it'll scale up for me. There we go. So what it is, I'm producing a lot of transactions. So I'm producing about, right now, 900 transactions that are all being executed locally because I have enough resource to run them locally. But a few of them made it out to Google, five, four, five, seven, nine, and a few, and none to Amazon, none to Azure at this point. So I already, I've already saturated my availability here, and it's already gone to, spilled over to Google just a little bit. Let's see if we can get a little bit more going at it. We'll find out. Okay, there it goes. So now we're spilling a lot to Google, 44 transactions, 35 transactions to Amazon, and 9 or 10 to Azure. And I've also basically scaled this based on cost because now I can say, CPUs at Azure are cheaper than they are at Amazon. I run more of my transactions on Azure if I want. And I've set it so that it's Google first, Amazon second, Azure last in this case. But you can choose that, right? You can choose how that works. Again, most of my transactions are still happening locally. Uh, 1,200 transactions right there happening locally. And you can kind of see how this looks over here. But I can also uh, come over here now and take my local worker offline Let's do that again and watch what happens. It's going to do some really interesting stuff real fast. Look at that. And I'm curious to see where it sent me. And I'm back on Google for my, my individual transactions. But you can see it's decided that it's load balancing across Google, Amazon, and Azure now. So I can basically, then I can come up here though and say, oh, let's take Amazon offline. Actually, let's take Google offline since that's the one that I was connected to earlier. So Google offline. Okay. There it goes. And I just have Amazon and Azure. Come back over here and do this again. And now I'm talking to Azure. All right. But I just want to kind of show you that idea. Because if you think about building your applications, I showed you a lot about running Java on Kubernetes tonight, right? And, I, and as I said, these are multiple three-hour presentations that I do. 
I kind of gave you just a high level of all of it. But the concept is, if you build your applications this way, and it doesn't require much, you know, you have to have these little YAML files for your deployment, maybe you have some Istio routing rules, things like that. But when you have that, you can then run it anywhere that you want to run it, in any data center that you can have available to you, because Kubernetes runs everywhere. It runs on bare metal, right? If that's all you have is a bunch of servers, you can run on a bunch of Raspberry Pis, wouldn't recommend it, but it can be done. Um, you can run on a bunch of old laptops. You can run on a bunch of VMs. This is actually just one virtual machine running at Amazon, one virtual machine running at Azure, one virtual machine running at Google to run my applications there. That's all. So I'm hardly paying anything for this right now. I'm not paying hardly any money. Uh, so you know, you can run it anywhere you like. And the good news is you can just kind of decide. Oh, let's let's bring the local one back online. Okay. And it takes a second for that worker, uh, worker to come up. And I'm getting these errors because it's got, uh, the error has to do with the fact that I've changed the clock. But see what happens. As soon as the local worker comes online, it takes the work. And I'm curious to see. Yep, I'm see I'm back on Burr here too. So again, local affinity is important. I don't have to go across the network if I don't need to. So this is a very powerful concept. This is one of my favorite demonstrations. We got it working just a few months ago. And then uh, I just got it working for you guys for for, uh, for running in Mexico City today. So I just got this working on Monday, Tuesday. The the Java code for this looks very simple. Do I have it up and running here? No. This one. Okay. Here. Yeah. Here's the Java code for that one. And, uh, worker. There it goes. <laughs> so basically, it's just processing messages. This is a uh, Vertex code again. This is processing messages, and see it has a flag for uppercase or a flag for reverse, and it prefixes OLED to it. That's all. But it can do anything you want. If you're doing, you know, Bitcoin mining or whatever, you know, <laughs> it could be anything. So that's that's really, I think, is that enough information for one night? Are your brains bleeding out of your ears? <laughs> Is that you think that's good? Because I really could go on all night. But let's, let's let's actually run this Twitter thing real quick. See if we have some winners. Okay, where'd that go? Where'd that go? Let's see if how many people figured out the Twitter game. Okay, I'm gonna run the run the little application. All right, looks like it's coming up there. And that's this one right here. So we said Java Cube. Let's refresh it. All right, well, there's a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, okay? And the winner is Ruggy. <laughs> All right, there it is. So we'll, here's what we'll do. So you're the first first winner, you get a book, okay? Come, you can come grab the book. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you. But we got more winners. We're going to just hit refresh and see what happens. Let's go through the books first. New Jave. Who's that one? All right, look at that. And so basically it's looking for a pound Java cube at first setter, right? That's what it's looking for there. Uh, let's go here. Come on, come on, come on. Refresh. There we go. A ruggy again. It, it's just picking randomly. We'll pick, we'll go through a couple of these. Super search? Who's our super search? <laughs> okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I can use different tools for picking these different things, too. So let's try this one. This is Java Cube. Let's see what this one picks. We'll just pick the first one off the list when it refreshes. Oh, it's Ruggy again. So so apparently people aren't figuring out the formula. Java Cube plus Burst Setter. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see here. I got a lot of notifications. Let's see here. All right, so that doesn't have the Java Cube hashtag in it, right? Okay, so <laughs> let's see what this one says. And Mr. <laughs> Mr. Pato? Okay, fantastic. Well, you get a book too. We're gonna get down. We're gonna get through these books and get to the Chromebooks, okay? And you can win again, by the way. You know, we'll, we'll, that's not a problem. Let's see who this one picks. We got Ruggy again, but you already have a book. So, uh, let's see what this one says. You know, it's just, just different randomization. 
Okay, that puts rugby tie. Okay, let's try this one. You notice there's not many in there. How about no Diaz? No. Derby no? Okay, fantastic. So you get you get a, a book also. All right. Lot, okay, we're getting a few in here now. Let's see here. We got that one for a book. We probably should just, okay, let's do this. Let's move to Chromebooks. You got, and we'll figure out, we'll just give these away later. All right. So on the next one, the next person gets the Chromebook. All right, you ready? Mr. Bato. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, well, look at that. All right, we got one more Chromebook. So you guys ready to hit the button one more time? Yeah, here it goes. Rich Death. That's a new one. Aha, look at that. Fantastic. And you you got the you win like for coolest name. Coolest name. And then uh you well, you can just decide who should get these later. <laughs> okay? But the the deck is again Bitly Istio intro. All right, that gets you to the slide deck. The tutorial is Bitly Istio tutorial. Okay, if you want the nine steps presentation, which covers the how to make the JVM blow up, okay, that's bit.ly nine steps awesome. There's also the GitHub repo. Everything is documented, so you guys have that. This, I teach these as three-hour classes, though, for like O'Reilly, uh, and I also am teaching it at, at DevOps Belgium as a three-hour class. Same thing goes with this one. It is also a three-hour class. So if you guys have, if you're part of Safari Live, that's where I run them through Safari Live. Feel free to join those there. I'm working on a new one. There's a whole serverless presentation. Okay, so I'm working on this one now. This is still pretty new. Uh, we don't have time to walk through it tonight, and I don't have that uh, virtual machine running. But, you know, how do you actually have function as a service and serverless capability running on your Kubernetes system? That's kind of the next generation that people will be looking at in 2019. But so hopefully that gives you guys plenty of information, maybe too much information. Did you guys have a good time tonight? Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for having me here because I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for the organizers and, of course, our sponsors for the meeting room. I got to tell you, that's a huge, huge win. Yes, please. Go. And Nearsoft does have 40 positions. <laughs> So when I get when I do my serverless presentation, you you'll definitely see that there's uh, Amazon Lambda is the king of the universe. Yeah, they, they are. Absolutely. But when you use Amazon Lambda, you're now locking in your code to theirs. And you're locked in, and that might be okay. You might love Amazon. You have lots of stock in Amazon. You made a lot of money, <laughs> <laughs> and that's good. You know, if you if you can afford two thousand dollars a share, you should buy some because <laughs> it's two thousand dollars a share. Okay, okay. okay, but so seriously, if you're using Lambda, buy stock also. <laughs> so because you are definitely buying into the Amazon way of looking at the world. What we're trying to do with the Kubernetes ecosystem is to make sure that all the code you create is fully portable across all Kubernetes distribution. So Amazon, Azure, Google, on premise. So with like OpenShift on premise of Red Hat, that's we have hundreds and hundreds of customers with hundreds and hundreds of applications, or maybe thousands of applications. Like one of the customers today told me that 500 applications already on OpenShift running on premise Kubernetes. So they like being not locked in. They don't own a lot of Amazon stock currently. Uh, but that's how you should think of it. You can you have portability now, and you have the ability to move your code, move your code not. From Lambda to Lambda, but shit, from, from Amazon to Google to Azure. It's portable. That's really the biggest win. And that may not mean much to you. Uh, it, I mean, 
But not, and not for everybody, though. Because and here's and here's why I make that point. In a world that's digitally transformed, right? That's the world we're living in. Your marketing department and your CEO and your big boss, they want you to deliver software ever faster. The fact that you can deliver software every three months is way, way too slow. The competition delivers software every week, okay? We should be able to do a one-week sprint, go to production in a one-week sprint. Two-week sprint to production. Three-week sprint to production. And if we have, this team is our two-week sprint team, and this team is our one-week sprint team, you should be able to deploy on Thursday at 10 a.m. and Tuesday, every Tuesday at, at 10 a.m. and every other Thursday at 10 a.m. because two weeks spread. And that's the same company, same system. That's the new world we're trying to get to, we're living in. And so that might mean you just pick the easiest tool for the job, which might just be that. Because now I'm not So that's, I think Java people do worry about lock in a bit more than, let's say, C people. <laughs> or C sharp people. Okay. Yeah. Java people tend to be like, I want to have some more portability because that creates future flexibility. And a word that we're gonna we might see more of uh, in the future is called optionality. I'm creating future options for myself. Yeah, it means I pay a little today, but as a future of greater flexibility, which means I can move my skill set and my code. Other books. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of it. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. All the books, as I mentioned, uh, like the Istio book, these books are available to you, by the way, at developers.red.com. That's the program who flies me around the world. We have our free ebooks. This book, by the way, is very important from uh, Edson Yanaga on my team. Uh, great book that talks about just tips and tricks to deal with a monolithic database. And a microservices architecture. If you have other ideas, please send those in to me or Edson. We're, we're, we love gathering those ideas. And Edson did a nice job last year documenting them all. Uh, we'll probably come up with blogs for that too, things like that. But that's a very critical area that people are stuck on. It's like, well, I have this old clunky DBA and database. How do I deal with that? They're not a zombie. Okay. <laughs> okay. But as I said, we could talk all night long. So I know there was there some food that was brought in, and you guys are probably hungry. Yeah, well let's have some food and some drinks, and I'll be here to answer more questions though if you want. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.